Let's go back to your concern, which is he's not going to go away. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some will say Obama's not gone away. Okay. Some Republicans will say Obama is still around and Obama's running, uh, aside from trying to do stuff, what he's doing with uh, his chef, but, you know, he's still around, (laughs) you know, with uh, uh, Biden, you know, encourage him to do that. Now, that that could be right. That could be wrong. And you can debate it, but no one knows 100 percent. Both sides are going to kind of be like. You know, no way. Obama's living his life, and he, this whole concept about Michelle running against never going to happen. Fine, it's a good t- topic that we can debate. And for you to say, I think he's not going to go away. I actually don't know if I disagree that he's not going to go away. Mm-hmm. But I think the way he's not going to go away is like a founder of a company is so concerned about uh, uh, the policies that he put in place that he doesn't want the people that come after him to. Eliminate those policies. Like, do I think Bush cares? I don't really think Bush cares. Like, listen, I'm done. L- leave me alone. Mm-hmm. I'm gone. I don't want to come and say stuff. Let me just go do my own thing, right? Do I think Hillary cares? Yes. Do I think Bill Clinton cared? I really don't think Bill Clinton cared. I think Bill Clinton's like, let me go do whatever I'm doing, right? I think Obama cares, and I think Trump cares, both of them. They, they're both legacy people, which is like, hey, you cannot undermine my legacy. Is it a valid enough of a concern to be that worried about it? I don't know. The, the part I would bring back to you is the following. It's been very interesting seeing how you're reacting to strange things and communities targeting you. For example, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Anna Kasparian doubles down after, this is earlier, this is like six months ago, after bashing trans inclusive term birthing person as degrading to women. Okay. Now, somebody's going to be like, well, wait a minute. Anna would never, why would, is this, is this the same Anna from Young? That's not possible. That can't be. This is a mistake. This is a fake story, right? She would never debate birthing person. She should be okay with that. But no, progressive media host Anna Kasparian stood firm in her criticism of the term birthing person as degrading to women. She responded to backlash with humor, stating laughing out loud the meltdowns over wanting to be referred to as a woman rather than a birthing person is pretty wild, and emphasized her refusal to apologize, saying, I'll never apologize for that, especially as a biological woman who has had the effing lifetime of being told I'm less than. Some progressive criticized Kasparian for her stance, comparing her to J.K. Rowling and (laughs) accusing her of bigotry. Transgender activists clarified that the term birthing person was not used to describe individual women, but rather to include trans men and non-binary people in discussions about pregnancy. So I listen to this. I'm like, okay, if a person doesn't know you, but they know of you and you're with Young Turks, or typical criticism in my Armenian community circle, I just kind of, you know, it's not like you don't know it. How could she work with the guy that said such and such about Armenian genocide? Okay, cool. I've heard that a million times. She's a socialist, Bernie Sanders, da, da, da. Okay, she's a Trump, you know, what's the TDS, whatever. The, oh, the derangement yeah. syndrome. Yeah, she's part of, she's this, she's that. Okay, that's the, that's the criticism when, you know, friends are talking. I said, okay, cool. But then this kind of brings it out to like, no, she is actually not wanting to be bullied and categorized and cornered to have to agree with everything that's taking place. So you're almost experiencing a little bit of what Trump experienced as an individual that they're now attacking you. Yeah. And you've been for some of these guys, but now they're coming after you. So do you kind of see yourself saying, look, I don't, I don't know if I'm either it's I'm not the Anna of who I was five years ago, 10 years ago. Maybe I'm also maturing with some of my policies, maybe or growing with some of my policies or no, I'm not the Democrat of three years ago or socialist of five years ago. I'm I'm also evolving today. W- what's going on with your transition? Well, hold that thought for a second, because I'm going to answer that question. Please. But before I do, I, I want to address one other thing, um, which is how much of a badass I am, okay? (laughs) And the reason why I say that is because I single-handedly persuaded the most well-known Turkish American, Cenk Uygur, to on his show multiple times acknowledge the Armenian genocide. I did that, okay? I could have just given him the middle finger and said, you're a Turk. I don't work for Turks. I'm an Armenian. And I could have just demonized him for what he wrote when he was literally in college. He was a dumb college student who had a lifetime of Turkish propaganda in his head about the Armenian genocide. And I decided, no, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to persuade him of what the actual truth is. And I did that. And I give myself a lot of credit. No one else does. Armenians don't. But I'm going to give myself credit because persuading people, doing the hard work of persuading people 
That takes effort. That takes strength. And we don't have a lot of that in America right now. We have a lot of crying and whining about people not agreeing with each other. And then everyone goes off in their own corner. Everyone takes their ball and they go home. Okay. So to answer your question, you are correct. I, I do not like to be bullied or pressured into saying things or believing things that I do not believe. I find that terminology degrading. Okay. That I personally, because I'm not a birthing person, okay? I'm a woman. What's wrong with being called a birthing person? Well, first of all, um, not all women even have the capacity to get pregnant. So it's degrading to them to be, essentially, to have their, their womanhood questioned if, they, if like, they're not what a point. unable, yeah. if they're unable to have uh, kids to begin with. But also, I mean, look. This is, this is the thing that annoys me about this entire issue and conversation, because they'll turn around and they'll say, no one's calling you a birthing person. Okay, um, does someone need to call an individual who finds the N-word offensive the N-word in order for him or her to find it offensive or degrading? You get what I'm saying? Of course. No one needs to be called that word to find it problematic or to have an issue with it. And besides which, I was called that. OK, yes, in a medical setting, but this is a doctor who knows I'm a biological woman. Call me a woman. But I had a conversation with that doctor. Why did you feel the need to call me a birthing person? Like, where did that come mm -hmm. from? And in California, medical providers are basically like told that there will be penalties if they don't use the proper terminology or if they're caught doing anything discriminatory. Uh, toward the trans community. Now, if they're actually doing something discriminatory toward the trans community, I think medical providers absolutely should face consequences. But the idea that we should change all of our terminology, even toward women who want to be called women, in order to be inclusive is ridiculous to me. Now, if a transgender person wants to be called that, fantastic. I respect it. I'll do it. I'll engage in it. But I think in the context of my relationship with my doctors, I want to be called a woman. It's not that difficult. It is my personal preference. Okay. That doesn't mean that I in any way believe that transgender people should be treated differently or that they should be discriminated against or that they should not live lives of dignity. I have had an entire career defending them, supporting them. And this one issue led to ridiculous outrage among a fringe component of that community. They are not representative of the entire transgender community. And for that fringe component, if they think that they're going to shut me up and force me to say things I don't believe, they've got another thing coming, okay? I'm gonna say what I think every, every single time. Do you think they're crossing the line a little bit and it's getting a little bit too ridiculous in certain sections? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And who's, they turn people off with and, it. And, and, and again, it is a fringe component of the transgender community, and they don't even realize how counterproductive they're being. And, and who's allowed for that to happen? Who's, who's been a part of that becoming a reality? Who do you think? Look, I think most people want to do the right thing, okay? And so they want to be as accepting and tolerant and inclusive as possible, mm -hmm. and they don't want to come across as being in any way discriminatory. And I respect that. I think that it comes from a good place. But they shut their brains off sometimes and just go along with things without considering maybe some of the unexpected consequences, how others might feel about what they're engaging in. I think that there's this conflation um, with the gay community and the transgender community, because think about it. Like, I think a lot of people on the, on the left think of the trans community the same way they thought of the gay community, right? Like, yeah, why not legalize gay marriage? Like, what's wrong with that? Who's it hurting? But when it comes to some transgender issues, there is a lot on the line, right? Like when we do talk about kids transitioning, you want to make sure that we have a system in place where there's a proper protocol implemented to ensure that we're not transitioning kids who might not actually be transgender. You think it's okay to transition kids under the age of 18, even if the parents consent? What do you mean, medically? Medically. <sighs> Anna, you seem very smart to me, and I think you have common sense. <laughs> yeah, I do have common sense. I. I think it's a very difficult question to answer, okay? I think that it is a problem when certain states completely ban it because there are instances of 
let's say teenagers who identify as transgender, they're legitimately transgender. And I don't want to cause harm to those people, right? I think it's a really, it's a decision that's left, that should be left between the parents and the doctors. But at the same time, there are certain things going on where I do worry. Like, have, I don't know if you guys have read about the Tavistock Clinic in the UK that's shut down. And the reason why it shut down is because it just became this system of transitioning minors without really doing the proper protocols to ensure that they're, you know, they're working with people who are legitimately transgender. Okay, so you're 14 years old. I don't know if you said 14 or 13 years old. When your mom tells you, what do you want to be? You said, I want to go be an actress. She's not going to be a pachatsats, right? And yeah. you said, I'm going to go be a Barbara Walters. Why don't you go be a journalist? Okay, right. That's exactly what I want to do. And I go, okay. What if your mom doesn't say that to you? What if your mom doesn't put that in your head? What if you go into Hollywood? Maybe your life's going to be a different story today. I don't know what it's going to be, good, bad, or ugly, but it's going to be a different that's life. That's probably what But what life. I'm saying is it's, it's <laughs> yeah. going to be a very different life. I actually think you would, because you have drive, but yeah. it's going to be a different life no matter what direction you would have gone to. But the point I want to make is with this whole concept of even entertaining the thought of it being okay before the age of 18, you know, th then that means like my idea, I have a controversial idea. I would rather have a 15 year old kid that has a job paying taxes vote than a 28 year old person who's never had a job, never paid taxes. That person shouldn't vote. So Pompey says, you're out of your mind. I get it. It's a, it's not a, you know, normal idea that I'm proposing. You have the right to say you're out of your mind. But mm -hmm. my, what, what my idea is, I want to give people the right to vote who earn the right to vote, who have contributed to society, minus those who have disabilities, things like that. That's not what I'm talking about, or elderly. All I'm talking about is a 15-year-old person should have the right to vote who is paying taxes, has a W-2 job, has paid $3,000 of taxes, whatever, versus 28-year-old who hasn't. But this concept of saying, yeah, I think my son told me, you know, he's a girl, you know, and he, we have to do this, and da, da 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 and they're crying, getting emotional. I think we have to be a little less tolerant to stupidity and insanity. If you're 19 years old and you say, like my kids will say, that my son is having this tattoo conversation with me. Here we go. <laughs> and you know which son it is. He's like, hey, but you know such and such has tattoos. I said, but Michael Jordan didn't have tattoos. He said, that's a good point. I said, Brady doesn't have tattoos. By the way, I hope these guys don't have tattoos in weird places. All I know is I don't, I've Probably. never seen yeah, tattoos. Yeah, yeah. You don't know Michael could have a tattoo of goat somewhere you're never going to see. Like, or, what? But, but all I'm saying is these guys are just like, what about this? Mm -hmm. And what if I want to mm -hmm. get it? I'm like, dude, let me just put it to you this way. When you're 18, you can get it. Mm -hmm. Till then, I'm not going to support you getting a tattoo. After that, do your thing. My goal is to try to encourage you and as much as I can to one day not do this, right? Right. I mean, but that's your parental right, okay? So I think that I get uncomfortable getting in between a parent, their child, and their doctor, right? I actually do believe in parental rights. And so I do have an issue with some of these schools uh, and school districts promoting policies of keeping parents in the dark when it comes to their child transitioning. That's in the state of and, California. And sometimes. Yes. Yeah. And the reason why I say that, understand, yeah. look, I think that like in the state of Florida, in the legislation that they passed, there are exceptions for kids who might like, if there's reason to believe that their parents are going to be abusive, if they're informed of this, right. There is a carve out in the legislation in Florida to ensure that the teachers have the ability to withhold that information from an abusive parent or abusive parents. I think that's important mm -hmm. because there are cases of parents who are abusive and might be awful to their kids, might maybe beat them, might disown them yeah. if they find out they're trans. So that's why I think it is important to have protections for those kids. However, at the same time, We've all acknowledged that the suicide rates among transgender people are high. And if I had a child who started identifying as transgender and I was not informed about it, I would lose my mind because I would be concerned oh, sure. that I'm not there to help with my child's mental health. Things. But those are two right? different things. So I want, I, yeah. want, I want you to go. OK, so are you saying that a parent should have the right to allow their kids to transition uh, and change their sex. You're saying that should be the parents' consent. Yes, but I do think that there should be protocols in place and safeguards in place in the medical industry 
Let's go to, one step forward. Yeah, and by the way, let me be clear. So w- when we talk about medical transition, I'm not talking about surgeries. I'm talking surgery and oh, taking no, no, the hormones not, and stuff okay, like that. Uh, no, no. Okay, so puberty blockers, I think, should not be, like, outlawed. Okay, puberty. There, so there's puberty blockers, and then there are the cross-sex hormones. Pre-18 okay. puberty blockers you're okay with. I think in, in instances where there is a proper protocol in place to ensure... Come but, and it, but I'm okay, not so a let me, let me, science that let me, hasn't let me wrap up this. We haven't seen what the outcome yeah. of these... 20, it hasn't been 20 years to see how much these kids are going to have suicide. I think so, at 14 years old, I get what you're saying. The yeah. parent, it's Pat, it's your kids. I, don't, I would never get involved. I could give a suggestion, but to alter a child's biological makeup in the long run, I just don't... Here's a question. The thing with puberty blockers is it depends on how long they're taking it, right? If they're taking it for a long period of time, there are possible side effects that are damaging and it it, it would cause irreparable harm. So I I, understand where you're coming from. When it comes to the surgeries, though, I'm entirely against the surgery. So that's good. So so that's good that we have one step. But I want want to ask you this question. So you're Armenian. I'm Armenian. Mm -hmm. There's another legendary Armenian out there called Jack uh, Kevorkian. I don't know if you know who Mm -hmm. Jack Kevorkian was. Dr. Dr. Death. Dr. Suicide, right? He was Armenian. Legendary, right? They made a movie about him. I I think Pacino played or De Niro played. Pacino. Pacino Pacino. played him, yeah. So this guy... You know, hey, life is hard. You want to commit suicide? I'll do it for you. Don't worry about it. Life is very hard. So what if we get to a situation where mom and dad consent, son comes, daughter comes saying, life is so freaking hard. I can't do it. I want you to take me to the modern day Jack of Orkin. Okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I want to, I want to, I want you to take my life away. And mom and dad pray on it. And they say, look, if that's what our kid wants, let's go take him in. I mean, look, obviously I'd be against that because- where maybe if I explain where I'm coming from, you yeah. can understand my my thoughts on this, right? I want to implement policies that cause the least harm to people, right? Transgender teenagers exist, and suicide rates among transgender people, especially if they're not able to feel comfortable in their own bodies, right? That that suicide rate is real, and so how do we balance? Okay, the concerns of potentially causing damage to kids who aren't actually transgender, because that exists, right? There are detransitioners, and and I my heart breaks for them because they've they were on puberty blockers for a long period of time. It did cause harm to their bodies, irreparable harm, and so I feel bad for them, and I want to minimize the instances of that happening as much as humanly possible. At the same time, for teenagers who legitimately are transgender. I don't want to cause harm to them by entirely banning a medical process that could be beneficial to them. My point is, I don't believe that it is up to me to decide. I don't believe it's up to anyone in this room to decide what the right course of action is for them. I think it's up to the parents, the doctors, and you know the, the individual in question themselves. I have a question. It's sort of a macro conversation. Are, are you leaving this topic? No, I'm not leaving this topic right. whatsoever. I'm actually staying right here. By the way, shout out to... Dr. Kaborkin, all the work that he's done with the youth in Asia. That's yeah, the, yeah. Boyaka Shah with Boyaka. everything that's been going on with that. Yeah. Um, with youth in Asia. But to me, mm-hmm. and I want to stay here. This isn't a pivot. This is such a ridiculous distraction. What do I mean? Mm. Okay, there's so much going on in the world. Okay, we're, we're at $33 trillion in debt. We've got runaway inflation. Interest rates are to the roof. People can barely make their car payments, mortgages, everything that's going on there, foreclosures. We're on the verge of a regional conflict that can go to World War III. And in America today, we're debating what the fuck is a woman? No, what is I, happening I what in saying, American yeah. society that we're even having this long, elongated discussion where it's poignant and it's very like tangible, like, all right, birthing person, woman. It's like the rest of the world is looking at us and they're laughing mm-hmm. that, that America can't even get their shit together. This beacon of hope, this beacon of light, this shining city on a hill, this, am- this amazing situation that we have in America, and we're having hour-long debates, what is a woman? Right. China's right. laughing at us, Russia's laughing at us, and here we are, very smart people, very informed people, and we're having deep discussions of whether Anna over here is actually a woman or not, or she's a <laughs> yeah. birthing person. What's and, your question? And, so my question is, why are we so preoccupied with this? Is this not one big distraction, the culture nope. wars, You're the identity distracting attract- from the topic, but, uh-uh. No, no. I'm you're not dis- distracted. But you from are, the topic. though. You're, no, you I'm, are, though. I'm I want to see why this is such a. But big I don't want to. I, I don't want to go to that topic. I want to stay on this topic. That's a completely different topic. Let us transition away from this. 
I'm still on this topic. The question we're asking right now is very important. We've gone through trans. She's not for the transition. She's for the medicine pro-hormones. In some cases, then I bring in Kevorkian. Is that something that we should allow parents to do if the kid wants to take their lives because it's hard? She's then saying no. Then it goes down to some people from trans are having true mental issues that they're going through, which is the next thing you said. Fair. I'm with it. But I want to know why. The other day, I have this guy at the uh, uh, Rob. Who? What's what's our friend's name that we talked to? The plumber, <laughs> legendary plumber Eric Hecker, who's a, uh, a Raytheon whistleblower. I can't, I can't wait, wait for this I'm to come up. I'm telling wait. you, you will be entertained the entire time. But he said something very interesting. He said, "You know what is mental illness, and how long has mental illness been around?" He says, "You realize if you have heart issues, we can show you have heart issues. Yeah, you can." You got a murmur, or you got blood clot, high blood pressure, or you got high blood pressure. There is data to say that. He said, "How do we uh, measure bipolar? How do we measure, you know, depression? How do we measure all?" And he's going through all, asking all these questions. And he says, "How do we know that? We don't know that." So you go to a doctor. What is actually the test for a doctor to know that you have bipolar ADHD? What's the test? He's just asking you a few questions. Well, yeah. What are you dealing with? What do you go? There is no test. There is no data. They, your blood scored this, or you're the. So I'm sitting there listening to this guy. I'm saying, first of all, I don't, you know, okay, maybe interesting point. But then what has this led to? It's led to a multi, multi-billion dollar product, Big Pharma. Okay. So how profitable are these transitions? How profitable are these puber puberty blocker products? By the way, I know you're saying, you know, why are we talking about this? There's other things going on in the world. For people that have kids, mm -hmm. this is a major concern to them. Because their kids are being fed this bullshit on a daily basis at public schools, and parents are concerned, very concerned in some markets. I'm, I'm not concerned at this point because I've been talking to my kids about this stuff very closely, and we have certain resources. Not everybody has certain resources to put them in public schools. So for me, all I'm going back to is when you were saying the, the depression, you know, where people are at, if you work with me, like if let's just say I'm talking about this yesterday. Melva, our nanny, 13 years, she uses the word poblecito with the kids. Oh, poblecito. I'm like, what the hell is this like poblecito? Little poor baby. Poor baby. But yeah. I'm like, Melva, they're not poor. <laughs> <laughs> These kids are not poor. Don't tell them they're poor. Yeah. And Jen will say, poor Brooklyn. I'm, I said, babe, Brooklyn is not poor. She has a cell phone. Don't. She doesn't have a cell phone. But joke, don't joking. put that word in her mouth. Certain words we use, that's. The parent's responsibility. You allow those words to become real, and the parent didn't stop it. Tom, for you with two daughters, you're seeing this exchange in this topic. I told transition because I know Adam wants to talk other topics. No, no, we're gonna get not to, at all. I, th what's, this is important to discuss. What is what is, what is your uh, uh, thoughts when you're hearing Anna and I discuss this? Well, I have a unique perspective. My wife is a career teacher, educator. She's taught in public schools, LA Unified Public School, as a matter of fact, for 10 years, and she's uh, taught in private schools since. And I have two teenage daughters. Um, and so I have a house full of portable re reproduction units. And we... <laughs> <laughs> Took portable. me a second, but okay. I don't yeah. know how they'd feel about <laughs> being called that. They're uh, locking their bells. <laughs> if anybody has a couch I can sleep on for the next couple of days, let me know. I got you, know. Tom. I got you. The, so, but in all seriousness, what is happening in schools is, is kind of dangerous. We've gone to a movement of ratify and separate. It is in the public schools. Is ratify what they feel, whatever they feel, and then separate them from parental decisions. It is an intentional, it's, it's, a, it's a program, it's what the public schools want at high school. We want to ratify what you're saying and separate you from your parents. Whereas mental health experts will tell you, you want to, you know, process and counsel and that involves the bring the parents in but that's not what the schools want and so i see it on on that side where i can see schools that are actively and administrations and public schools that are actively pat trying to separate the kids from their parents in the first place and this is just another this is another way they do it rather than processing and counseling through you know, and you don't have to come down on the kid, but it's processing. You know what? Let's sit down with the counselor and your parents and let's talk about this. Let's get you in a safe place. Let's not have your dad turn, what? You, you want to be what? No, let's turn down the temperature in that room and let's embrace the child. Hey, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? Now let's process it and let's counsel through. Because most of the suicides come from isolation. 
It's the isolation in their own mind, and it's one word. It's hopeless. The word hopeless is what is tied to the majority of the teen suicides. And so how do they feel hopeless? Who is around them helping them feel hopeful, trying to embrace them, trying to process, trying to get to the center of where this is? Well, I've just never had a boyfriend. I've been really depressed. Sometimes they're going down bad decision lines. It's not a, you know, I've always felt this way since I was eight years old. No, they're going down some decision flows and other things that are happening socially. I just, look, the the problem that I have is the assumption... The assumption that like all parents are going to freak out and be super abusive to their kids if they find out that their child might be transgender. I I just don't think that's the right mentality to have. I do think that there are some maybe like religious fundamentalist parents who could actually freak out. And so, again, it is really important to ensure that whatever policy is implemented that there is consideration for children or for teens who might come from a family like that. However, no one loves these kids more than their parents for the most part. And I just know, look, I don't have my own kids. I have nieces that I'm very, very close with my brother's daughters. And the idea that anyone in our family would be abusive to these kids. If one of them legitimately like identified as transgender is ridiculous. And I think My brother and sister-in-law should have the right as parents to be able to be there for their daughters if one of them is going through something like that. You know what I'm saying? It's just like this preemptive notion that the parents are going to be awful. I want you to see this I agree with that. And remember, you can go into these public schools and it'll be like, don't tell your parents. They'll freak out. There is an assumption that's at the front of it. I agree with you 100%. I want you to look at this chart, Tom. U.S. sex reassignment surgery market. Markets. If you guys uh, are looking for a great investment, this yeah, is fantastic. Yeah, that's serious, okay? Seriously. Fantastic investment. Hey, Michael right Burry here. over here. <clears throat> Look at these procedures and how it's climbing Jeez. year by year. So you're thinking year. that the, the increase is really driven by the health industry. Um, oh, my and God. I mean, interesting. It, it, look, it, think of, uh, and by the way, I don't think I, I I would consider as one of the possibilities. I'm not saying this is it. I'm just, I'm a guy that wants to weigh out and do odds, right? This is a very profitable business. Like when you think about how much Prozac makes, how much these pharmaceutical companies make, and then, so the the business model is this. Guys, let's make $60 billion and we'll pay $3 billion in fines in 10 years. What a great business model, okay? So let's go make $80 billion and let's set aside 10% for fines. That's going to come back because we're going to screw a lot of people's lives. Mm -hmm. But we already made $80 billion. So put the 10% in a lawsuit that's going to come in 10 years. Here's the $8 billion. Guys, very responsible CFO. What a great job you did. And we'll call this $8 billion a marketing expense. It's not a marketing expense. It's a future lawsuit that's going to come that you screwed a lot of people's lives, okay? So this this pharma thing is not like a hypothetical. There's so many books written on people from big pharma that left the industry, were sick of it, and they said, this is really what's going on behind closed doors, and you got to kind of pay attention to it. By the way, very profitable, and typically these guys, if you look at lobbyists, Which industry has the biggest lobbyists? Can you pull up the biggest industry of lobbyists? Biggest industry of lobbyists. There's insurance is going to be up there, but you'll see pharma's up there. There you go. Look at the number right there. Pharmaceutical and health product industry has spent the most lobbying over the last 24 years. I think you and I may be on the same page with lobbyists. These guys are going around like getting massive paychecks, making all the money in the world, and they're Imposing laws. You well, mean, what a, I'm not you off right. What a great point because I was just writing here question marks. Why? Why the push? Why all this? Big Pharma is back. Just great example because why is the left all the uh, all the government pushing it so hard now? Five point two billion dollars spent on lobby in the last twenty four years. years. That's freaking insane. Three hundred fifty six million was just in twenty twenty one. And that push is working, Pat. Guess one out of four high school students in America identifies LGBTQ. Plus to whatever the, they're adding. Well, I, I think they're surfing day. the wave that has been made by purpose. you know the, the hyper liberal left on this. I think they're surfing the wave, but they are sure exploiting it and lobbying to it because EPS earnings per share is a sexy mistress. Follow the money. You always let's, say let's that. Let's go That's to the, the next story. Trends unless if you have final thoughts, trend, if right? you got final thoughts, I'll give it to you. Unless if we'll go to the next story. Yeah, California. the final thing I'll say is I think that our issue with legalized bribery leads to a lot of the distrust and a lot of the, you know, I'm not saying you're, you're engaging in conspiracies, but there, there's a lot of conspiratorial thinking overall in the country right now. And I think it's 
mostly driven by the distrust that we have in our institutions. And I think that distrust really comes from the fact that we don't really have politicians that are looking out for us at the moment. You know who we have politicians who are in like they're literally investing in individual stocks yeah. after getting briefed in closed door briefings on various issues around the world and in the country. Then they turn around and they trade stocks based on that information. That's insider trading. You, you have money in politics. You have these corporations. You have these lobbyists padding the pockets or the coffers, I should say, of these politicians. Yeah. So when you see all of this policy being passed that doesn't actually benefit ordinary Americans, that leads to the anger, that leads to the distrust. And I think it's really at the heart of a lot of the problems we have in this country. Wait, right you, wait you mean to tell me, Anna, that Nancy Pelosi didn't make her $150 million by no, luck? I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm I, don't, yeah. I don't know if you yeah. guys know this, yeah. but Nancy Pelosi is like <laughs> a genius when it comes to the markets. Weird. I mean, her her, 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 her husband, Paul, is predictive and. skills. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.